I see a lot of tendon problems as a result of wearing maximal shoes because for what they give in terms of that impact, they take away in terms of instability, which is the absolute thing we must try and avoid. We must try and be, as, we, have, we have a stable foot, therefore we don't want to create an unstable platform by putting an unstable shoe underneath it. The Triathlon Show 111. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and today's episode is part two in our two-part series on running biomechanics with Dr. Tom Hughes from Tri Mechanics. If you did not already listen to episode 110, make sure you go and do that first, as this episode will make much more sense if you do, uh, because you'll have missed a ton of important points that Tom made at the start of the interview otherwise. And also, I obviously already introduced Tom in that episode, so I won't do it again here, but we'll jump straight into the interview, or part two of the interview, after thanking our sponsors that help keep the podcast up and running. First, this episode is sponsored by Precision Hydration. They are the sweat experts that will help get you hydrated and keep you hydrated with their fantastic electrolyte drinks that you can match to your individual electrolyte needs based on your sweat rate and sweat sodium content. Not only do these drinks keep you hydrated and prevent cramps to help you perform to your potential, but something I haven't actually mentioned a lot at least is that they actually taste really great uh, compared to almost any sports drink which uh, you just suck it up and, and have it because you have to. But with these, they're actually very, very re- tasty and refreshing, I would say. Something I could have just sitting on the beach here in Portugal a hot summer day and uh, and just sip some pH. I could see myself doing that. Uh, although with the amount that I train and podcast and coach, I don't have much time for sitting at the beach. But hey, uh, maybe that day will come. So as you know, you can get one free box of Precision Hydration Electrolyte drink by going to precisionhydration.com and using the promo code DATTRIATHLONSHOW, all one word, all caps, at checkout to get that first box for free. And it really is, it's March, it really is time to start dialing in your hydration and nutrition for this summer's races. So get on it, people. Go to precisionhydration.com. This episode is also sponsored by Stack. The Stack Zero is a groundbreaking indoor bike trainer. It's the world's quietest trainer because it only uses magnets that don't touch the wheels to create the resistance. Uh, And when you get the trainer, you'll also find that it comes with wheel weights that are very smartly designed and they help produce an incredible road feel. So uh, yeah, you can can have your own road ride just sitting in your living room and watching the latest Netflix episode or uh, series episode on the series that you follow on Netflix, I should say. Also, be aware that uh, they have a version of the trainer that has a built-in power meter, which is great for those of you that don't have a power meter for your bike. And all of their trainers will be upgradable to variable resistance trainers very, very soon. And the best thing is, it's already very affordable compared to other trainers out there with comparable features. It's uh, 459 euros for the base version and 569 for the power meter version. But uh, get this, you'll get 20% off any of their trainer versions when you use the discount code TTS20 on stackzero.com. All right, let's jump back right into where we left off with Tom Hughes from Try Mechanics. I have a couple of other questions that are that I want to get into. Uh, so one is running cadence. Uh, what uh, do you have any opinions on, on what we need to know about running cadence? Well, yeah. So so running cadence is really really important, but maybe not exactly for the way it's often been shown. It does seem to reduce running injury. 
but we're not exactly sure why. So, so, so do you mean higher cadence reduces? Yes. Uh, yeah. So high cadence seems to, because it reduces the basically basically it's because a low long cadence crashing down, particularly with a big heel strike and braking forces, seems to promote this this absorption of the impact forces. If you imagine you've got a faster a faster cadence tends to promote a landing beneath the hips, which as we've said before, you imagine your lower leg is like a spring system and we're giving that energy back out. Now, if we're giving that energy back out, we reduce the energy we take in, we do, we do less damage, we can run further, faster and longer basically and less injured. So if you've got a long, slow cadence, then you're often creating a braking force because you, you, if you're landing in front of the pelvis, you can't give that energy back out because if you were, you'd send yourself backwards. So having that faster cadence often promotes that. It's not absolute, but it often promotes that. The other thing about that faster cadence is that the, the, the spring system in the lower leg is on like a time release. Now imagine this in your head, you've got, you're playing with a spring in your hands, and if you push the spring in and then suddenly let go, it releases all its energy in one go. If you push that spring in and then slowly release it, you can absorb that energy straight and not actually release that spring's energy in one big burst. That's what we don't want to do, and that's what often happens. We land, we slow everything down, and we absorb all that energy. So that's why, because cadence, that's why it's so. That's why the number 180 came about. It's because that tends to be the kick, that point where people pass over the threshold of being able to reuse that recoil. Now, if you're someone that's really, really tall, like Jan Fredino, and you've got really, really long legs, you can get away with a with a cadence of 175, but that's literally the lowest end. All elite runners, if you look at the elite 10,000 metre final, are all running with a cadence of 180 onwards. It's not that 180 is an absolute, it's that normally that's the threshold beyond that. You start to use that recall. And almost all elite runners will use a combination of cadence and stride length to increase their speed. So that's why it's really quite important. So what you need to do is you need to measure your own cadence and then start to think, well, why is it slow? And the reason I believe that cadence slows down a lot is because we're unstable as we land. So if we've got an overly cushioned, unstable shoe, or we're landing with that crossover gait I talked about, or we're, talk, we're landing in front of the pelvis, that has to slow everything down because the, we have to slow down to stay on the ground for longer as we balance. So it's normally a case of right. So in those situations, you need to find what the root cause of the slower cadence is, rather than just trying to force it up, because otherwise, if you, do, if you keep the form and everything exactly the same and just try and take lots and lots of steps, you'll probably just get tired more quickly. So it's kind of thinking about the whole picture. So, so would you advise people to just think about how they run and uh, try to analyze it as they are running, why their cadence is perhaps slow? Or uh, should, is that where a running analysis may be an invaluable investment or uh, just having somebody film you? Do you have any tips for that? Well, that's one. That's the desire. That would be where the analysis comes in. You very useful with someone knows what they're doing is that they can look and say, well, you're spending a lot of time on the ground because of that instability. Now, if we get in, the thing about it is that what I then people to do is right. Let's take away that element. So they have to test. So, for instance, a really good test is get go to a, a treadmill just because it's a very easy thing to use. Measure your cadence as you're running at your normal pace and your normal shoes. Then take your shoes off and run barefoot. With that extra sensory input from being barefoot, it helps you learn, basically you suddenly get a lot more controlled. That's tends to what happens or what I see. You tend to then start landing beneath your pelvis because you have to, because otherwise you'd feel it if you weren't, and you've removed the instability element of the shoe. If your cadence suddenly picks up, you know where your problem's coming from. You know that, that shoe and the instability is causing a problem. And that's where you start work on it. So it's a, it's a, that's a really good method of finding that out. If your cadence is still relatively slow, then you know that you're probably your hip mechanics or the way you're thinking about the landing, i.e. you're probably landing and being told you should absorb energy and kind of sit down. And that's what then is slowing you, is kind of slowing that cadence down. So it starts to give a picture of where to go from there. And, and about that 180 number, just a couple of points. First, I think I just read a statistic that every single world record from the whatever 800 meters and up to the marathon has been broken with a cadence of in the range of 179, I think, to 
205 210 212 even something like that yeah. so uh, so it's uh, yeah it's it's a big range so 180 is not a magic number but it at race pace it seems to be the minimum uh, minimum effective if you look at what the the elites are doing and also obviously the famous jack daniels study where he analyzed elite runners at uh, at some marathon and and uh, checked their cadence and and everybody except one i think of 50 or 100 runners or however many he analyzed had had at least 180 as their cadence but one thing that comes up is um at e- normal easy runs your normal endurance runs just to go out and smell the roses should you have a, a cadence that high in those runs as well or is it okay to be a bit lower on those it's i think i still think it's important to have that high cadence the reason is is that when you go on those runs you've got to think about what you're trying to achieve you're actually trying to spend as long on the on your feet as you can so it's not about distance so if I can give the best advice to every person that's building up to a certain race distance or a marathon, stop measuring distance. Just measure time on your feet. And also measure, almost, you want to measure the amount of steps you are, because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to take more steps. You're trying to condition the lower legs. That's what you, You're not really developing the aerobic system, particularly not after a certain age. You're actually just trying to develop for running. For cycling is different. For running, you are just developing those tissues. So think about how many steps you can take. So try and take more steps. So that's the key thing. You're going out for a run. You want to think of it as a skill. You, you don't, you're not trying to get anywhere faster because actually you just it doesn't matter because you're training. You're not in a race. So take more steps if you've got them available. So every time you come to a, a hill, keep the intensity low by taking lots of little steps because each of those steps is improving that, that tissue resilience. So that's why I like people. What people to do is actually feel what happens. That's the key thing. Is they, people need to learn to get this recall energy. They need to learn what it actually feels like. That can be in part achieved through doing a bit of barefoot running, which is really, really fantastic for that. But also using a relatively responsive shoe. So if you only have hokers, you'll probably have a relatively slow cadence because all you sense is that you basically don't sense anything because it's like a cloud on the bottom of your foot. You've always got to have a responsive shoe or spend some time in a responsive position when you're running and you'll feel that impact and feel how to reuse it. Once you get that feeling, once you understand that feeling, when you go out and run on those, those longer, easy runs, you'll still have quite a fast cadence. Because what you're trying to feel, you know you mentioned about the 180, the reason, that's, the reason that is relevant is because the longest legged or the longest Achilles runners will have been around the 180 mark. The really short guys with really short Achilles will be around the 200 mark because it's all related to release frequency. You've got, you know, it's, it's not absolute by any means, but it's all related to the length of your spring. And that's how it works in, in physics. And that's the key thing is that that's why it was 180 upwards, because the tallest of tall runners were 180. Whereas these little short guys were closer to 200 to get the same recoil frequency out of their tendons. And that's when you're thinking, when you're going those long runs, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get as many of those tendon releases as possible. If you slow everything right down and you become, and I say people, people go out and run long and slow and they don't, they run lazily. Slow is not a bad thing. It should be slow. It should be very, very easy and slow, but we should never be lazy. We should always focus on having good form. Good. I mean, I remember bumping in, I bumped into him on a number of occasions, Alistair Brownlee out running around Leeds. He could be running as easy as he, as he wants to, and yet he still has a fast cadence and he still has great posture all the time. Because you imagine, what you're trying to do is entra- you're, you're trying to entrain a skill. And the best way to entrain a skill is to do it in the way that you would do that skill. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I talked about this before a couple of times, but it's like uh, like tr- uh, when you're playing an instrument, you, you don't do like the warm up or the cool down of something like sloppily. You, you do it properly as well, because otherwise you just you're not improving. You, you need the purposeful, uh, purposeful uh, practice to to make any progression. So. Exactly. So, yeah, it makes makes total sense. Uh, and you've mentioned shoes here on uh, a number of occasions so let's get into that as the final big topic and uh, yeah just uh, just roll with that what what's your take on shoes now in uh, yeah for for triathletes especially well i'm not really a fan of of the kind of maximalist at all mostly not because of the shoe not because of the cushion but because of the instability that they promote if you imagine the foot is an incredible thing. It is generally wide. It is. It moves. It actually moves in all these different movements and three-dimensional. It's not just forward and back. It's not like a slab. It's not just a balance point. It conforms to the ground, or we see that when we're barefoot. 
So you, if you imagine that's amazing structure. Now, if you put a really thick, unstable thing underneath it, then actually you're just going to create problems. And what it does is it does absorb some of that impact energy. And if it absorbs enough, then I guess that's okay. Problem is, is that most people find when they run in those shoes that actually their hips start hurting. I see a lot of tendon problems as a result of wearing maximal shoes because for what they give in terms of that impact, they take away in terms of instability, which is the absolute thing we must try and avoid. We must try and be, we have, we have a stable foot, therefore we don't want to create an unstable platform by putting an unstable shoe underneath it. The other thing about the maximal cushion is that it wear, they wear very unevenly. So even during the course, and actually Galen Rupp reported this in a new Nike shoe, because it was very cushioned, that towards the end of the marathon, he felt like he was unstable, and he actually lost a lot of speed, because the shoe had compressed unevenly throughout the actual distance of one marathon. And if you imagine he's using it for one race, imagine what happens when you use it for all those runs. This is what I see in those maximal shoes. The same opposite goes for minimal shoes. Having no cushion at all doesn't, is not good, and actually it's slower. The optimal cushion is between one and two centimeters, with the right width for the forefoot. And, and now we're talking he, now we're talking heel drop, right? Well, heel drop, no. Or are we talking actual, really. actual cushion? Yeah, just cushion itself. I believe completely zero okay. drop. There is no logic or need for a heel drop. If you can walk around with your, and this is a th key thing, but if you're spending all of your work day in a heeled shoe, you may need a heel drop initially in your running shoe. To, to cope with it. Often people think heel drop relates to Achilles and it really doesn't because that's Achilles problems are normally a three dimensional thing and actually related to that crossover more than the drop. But it's often a thing like it's like a protective, like people like think, oh, I must stick to the same drop. Actually, a shoe should be flat. And if you can walk around barefoot with your heel on the ground and not feel like you have to walk on your tiptoes, you will have no problem being in a zero drop shoe. But it's all about the depth of cushion. It should be all the way the same, all the way across the shoe. And about but most people find that between one and two centimeters, and the research backs this up, is, is most economical because it has that balance of diminishing the ground, almost the ground buzz, that, that impact, that kind of slightly nasty impact you get from, a, from the, the tarmac and that feeling of the tarmac that can make you, you know, sensitize the foot, but not providing too much cushion that becomes unstable. Do, do you have any sense. examples of, of, of shoes from common brands that have that, uh, that amount of cushioning, just so people can get an idea of what one to two centimeters uh, cushioning looks like? Well, I, I'm a big fan. So I, I have relatively wider foot and I'm a big fan of the ultra shoes, but I've found that they've, their more recent models have all been too thick and too cushioned and too heavy. They've got two new models, the Solstice and the, uh, the Vanish R, that look phenomenally good, that are around that exact you know, one to two centimeters. So they're a good example for the particularly people that find that they've got a slightly wider foot. Other examples are, if you look at the, the Japanese brands, the interesting thing about the Japanese brands is that often what you get sold in the kind of States or the UK are their more fashion-based shoes, or they're not, you know, they're, they're actual, they're, their best shoes are often saved for the Japanese market because they, you know, if you've heard of like Ekiden, this running relay, it's like marathon yeah. relay, and they're so into it. And they actually save, and even some of the brands like Adidas, there's certain shoes that Adidas pretty much only sell in Japan. And they are one to two centimeters. They are wide, they're, they're foot shaped in terms of that width around the forefoot, around the big toe position. They're low down, they're, they're perfect, they've got good uppers, they're light, because you want you know, the lightest shoe you can find that gives you a cushioning because weight is massive on the end of the foot. And they're, they're pretty much only available in Japan. But the companies like, say, Mizuno, like do things like the, the, the models like the, um, the Hitagami or the Ekiden, actually, the model. Yeah, the, Hitag the Hitagami is what I use as my, my race shoe and my fast interval shoe. I really like it. Exactly. They're a great shoe. I also think people, and this, will be, this is going to be controversial now, I'm afraid, but you have to stay away from those brands that are both narrow inherently but also unstable. I'm afraid on cushion, on cloud are probably the worst for this. Those weird, um, the kind of way they've got that rubber ring underneath the shoe, it, it deteriorates very rapidly. Newton as well, you know where Newton had the lugs, the activator lugs, the same thing happened with those. They created, when they were fine when they were brand new, and the same with the ons, they're brilliant when they're new, but as soon as they deteriorate after a very small amount of running, same with the hokers, they become very unstable and instability, it has to be avoided at all costs. That's the critical thing. If you are unstable, 
you will never gain that, that balance as you come into landing, you will struggle to get back off the foot again. And therefore you will lose a lot of energy, you'll waste tons of energy with that instability, but also you don't actually then get the, the activation or that muscle side of things working as well. So that's why I like people to find a kind of Goldilocks shoe, but also you know, that shoe that's in the, that middle ground. And then if a shoe has to be broken in or it has, and if it weighs more than a couple of hundred grams for a male shoe, it's too heavy because 100 grams on the end of each foot is 1% of energy. For me, you know, for my speed and my build and my height, my, my shoes vary from I've got a 75 gram pair of racing flats that I've used for a marathon that are cushioned enough. Wow. You know, they are, they're, they're cushioned because actually the upper is like a, a thin sock. So they, they save weight in the upper because you don't need a big thick upper. And I've got a 250 gram pair of shoes. Now, if I compare those two shoes in terms of pure physics for the length of a marathon, they could cost me five to six minutes just for that, that extra bit of, you know, a couple of hundred grams on the end of each foot because it's huge when it's on the end of a swinging pendulum. And you imagine at the end of an Ironman, what do you not want to happen? You don't want to have that end of that weight on the end of you. But if you go too minimal, that impact, that kind of shoe will compress. So every shoe will compress as you, as you run a marathon. And what you want is that you want halfway through it to still be cushioned enough for you. If you find halfway through it's feeling dead, then it was too, the cushioning was too minimal and was too compressible for what you needed it for. Mm. That's, that's very, very good knowledge, very interesting. What about barefoot running? What's your opinion on that? Relatively quickly, because we're going to start to wrap this up. Uh, but uh, yeah, I really want to hear your thoughts on barefoot running first. Well, obviously, that was a lot of what my studying was about. And it's because I, I started doing it a lot. I love barefoot running on grass because it's a, it's a training method. It's not, if you think, if you do barefoot running, people think, oh, you're going to run barefoot, you're going to run Vibrams on road. Not a chance. Those roads were not designed for that. Their feet were not designed for that. But the sensory input from running barefoot on grass can really help sort a lot of form issues out. It can actually sort a lot of those muscle issues out just naturally. And I do a lot of, I do almost all my barefoot running, you know, on a grass or a treadmill. It's a great tool. It's, it's like, as I say, it's a bit like if you were to have your swimming analyzed all the time, or you were to wear something that, you know, those paddles that help you learn how to position your arm. That's what barefoot running is a training tool. It's not to say you should use it in a race, but it's a tool there and it adds that sensory input. So I think it's a fantastic tool. And I advise all my runners, particularly over summer, find a patch of grass. It might even just be around your garden. It might just be a, you know, literally 10, 20 meters, walking barefoot, running little jogging barefoot, gets the foot moving again and actually enha enhances that balance and control, but also can really enhance your running. Definitely, definitely worth trying. Yeah, yeah. And one way that that I've used it and uh, and prescribed uh, my triathletes using it is to uh, before track workouts, for example, they they have a grass field, so then you can do like your warm up strides. You can do barefoot on on the grass and even drills and mobilization and those sorts of things, and and do exactly. your warm up laps on on the grass even. Uh, but, so I mean, people have been doing that this for years. This is the funny thing is there is nothing new under the sun, and you say about barefoot running or about all this stuff, and people are like, oh, it's a new thing, and it's not. Every track coach for the last 50 years has done, has got their athletes doing barefoot running. One of the best quotes I ever heard, I cannot remember who said it, but he said, he take any injured athletes, the one of the best solutions is walking barefoot on dewy grass. And it's so true because it sorts out those problems because it enables the foot to move again and the brain to resense things. But it's always been used. You know, the, the, the fantastic, you know, Percy Serity, this coach from, you know, the, from Australia that, that is, has amazing success. You know, barefoot running on on um, on beach and the kind of sand dunes. It's always been used, and now we've suddenly made it a big new fad. And it's nothing new. It's just getting back to where we were, basically. Mm, yeah, yeah, totally. And and I think that probably the problem is that uh, the over marketing of it with the Vibrams and and other barefoot shoes, it kind of made the subject so completely or discussion around the subject so polarized and, and exactly. that's kind of yeah we've gotten away from from the core of it so okay here are just a few very quick questions uh before the even quicker rapid fire questions but i want to hear you in two or at most three sentences uh say what's your take on first the pose method um again i don't like anything that tries to conform a method generally when people do the pose method um they get slower um, because they're trying to force a change so don't think about forcing a change in form um, 
just let's say address those issues and you will run naturally that's where i think about it i guess the answer is the same then for the next one she running i don't even know how you pronounce it is it she running yeah again the same principle some of these things can can help people learn certain movements and techniques but but generally um i think trying to conform a certain type of form it doesn't it's not how the body works at all and finally, various devices that are out there and coming out there that are measuring running biomechanics and in different ways providing some sort of analysis of your running biomechanics. So I quite I use the, the run scribes a little bit because they, they provide a really accurate way of that moving around the foot um, to show basically whether the, the person's been completely screwed up by their shoes. Beyond that, I, I, I don't really like a lot of technical metrics in running, um, beyond maybe occasionally measuring cadence and things. But to be honest, I run without a Garmin, without anything. Um, I don't believe that running power, I do not like the running power meters because I don't believe running is like that. I don't believe it's, it's not like cycling. It's not like an application. It's not a slow application of force because running has just got too many different variables. So I've not been a fan so far of running power. I've got a running power meter and I found it doesn't fit anything at all doesn't even fit a pattern for me that's for certain and doesn't fit a pattern for many of my clients okay that's it that's a very interesting take i i have to disagree i really like running with power and i think that but you're right that it's not like cycling you definitely need to uh need to treat that data very differently from how you would treat cycling data and and use it more to what's your the speed that you can get out of the power but uh yeah uh, definitely appreciate your your input on that and and your thoughts and 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 one thing that i should add is that it's not something that's going to magically make you a better runner <laughs> for sure no, no device is not a garmin or no running shoes or whatever it's just training it's the bullseye training exactly. and, and i think, I think i'm just i think i'm a bit of a purist at heart i think that's the thing is that i uh whilst i like my metrics for cycling when it comes to running i kind of feel like it's my um it was my previous kind of life and i just want to do it for fun so i kind of um you know as I say, like I just want want to relax and just enjoy the environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I get these uh, these questions and emails, and people think that because I have quite a few of these podcasts out there with like running with power, and and, and people think that uh, I'm uh, a bit of a data geek, which which I am, admittedly. But uh, I'm actually I, I'm out there training twenty hours per week, so I want to get the most out of my training. But but then many people that are maybe training six hours per week are asking me that will will the running power meter make me a better runner? And uh, the answer is no you you just need to to run a bit more and train train a bit more whether that's running or cycling or swimming and uh and that that's usually the answer so uh, yeah uh, okay let's move into the rapid fire questions and uh, these ones are really really short and fast one sentence 15 seconds the first one is what's your favorite book blog or resource related to triathlon or running endurance sports in general um i advise every one of my uh, athletes to read carol dweck's mindset the it's psychology book, best book ever you could ever think of, will take every swimmer that, or every triathlete that thinks they're a bad swimmer and put the word yet in there. I am not a good swimmer yet. I will be. Yeah. Fixed mindset versus growth mindset. She has yeah. a great TED talk as Brilliant. well. Brilliant. Uh, what's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? Oh, well, I think that I use a, I guess, Probably my bike. I've worn a Cervelo P4, which is probably the, the best bike I think that's ever been made. So I'm going to go for my P4. And what do you wish you had known or wish you had done differently at some point in your career? I wish someone had told me that with my really long legs and my hips that don't work properly, that maybe triathlon is probably not the best sport for me. And uh, I'd have gone back and just been a runner. Okay. Are you stuck in triathlon now or are you I'm, considering... I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in triathlon. I'm addicted to it like anyone else is. So, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it's all too common. <laughs> it's all yeah. too common, unfortunately. All right, Tom, this has been brilliant. Really, really brilliant. And uh, yeah, I'll split this up into two interviews because we've gone on for so long. I kind of anticipated that. So uh, so yeah, this, this uh, will cover a week of, of episodes on, on the show. But uh, I think that it's been absolutely fantastic value and a lot of really useful and practical takeaways for the listeners so thank you very much and uh, finally tell the listeners where they can find you try mechanics.co.uk are you on social media as well or yes so under um so yeah www.trymechanics.co.uk is the site and then social media wise i tend to put a lot on twitter um under try mechanics i do my own podcast which is often pretty much almost every day at the moment 
20 minutes of me talking about certain subjects. Um, so that's on iTunes under the Try Mechanics um, podcast. Um, and then Facebook under Try Mechanics. It's all, all, if you search for Try Mechanics, all one word, you'll find me on all the different bits and pieces. Yeah. And for the leads based listeners, then uh, you can uh, check out your, your facilities and, and get in for a running analysis, of course. Exactly. Everything will be linked up to in the show notes so that they, people can find you very yeah. easily. And for people a bit further afield, we, we do uh, offer kind of remote analysis looking at videos. Obviously, it's not as anywhere near as comprehensive as what we can cover in, in the studio, um, but it can sometimes give a little bit of an idea of where people could start working on. And I've had some good success with, with people in far distant parts of the world. Um, by doing a bit of video analysis. So it's not the end of the world if you can't get into leads. All right, brilliant. Well, thanks again, Tom, and uh, you have a great day and uh, talk to you later. You too, thank you very much, bye-bye. So when I sat down to list my top takeaways from this episode, I started to realize that there really were too many things that are super important and uh, super fascinating in this episode, so I really couldn't pick out the most important. It was very difficult, at least if I wanted to limit it to two or three. But so these takeaways are not necessarily any more important than some of the other things we talked about. But these are maybe the one ones that stood out to me for various reasons. And uh, yeah, I just want to mention. First, we have sitting. And the reason that I picked up on this is that I do it a lot. I'm sure almost all the listeners of the show do as well. That's just the way that uh, that jobs in the 21st century are designed. And uh, if you can get that fancy, soft, uh, cushioned chair out of your office and get a stool instead, how much of a difference that will make to you, that's, uh, that's something that can make a massive impact on your running. And that's something that I actively try to think about I don't have a chair like that. I do have a chair with back support, although it's a wooden chair. And uh, what I try to change is that basically, if I, I don't use the back support at all anymore, I just sit more, a little bit more towards the edge of my seat, still having my sit bones for, firmly un- anchored on the chair, but not using the back support. So I sit as if it was a stool and uh, try to do that. So yeah, I'm implementing Tom's advice right away. And I think it works well with, with my chair, but if your chair doesn't allow that, then you need to make sure that you get a chair that allows you to do that. The second thing is cadence, and the reason that I picked up on this is that this is something that I see a lot of my athletes have too low cadence, like way too low. And I asked Tom specifically about if it's okay to have a lower cadence than 180 on easy runs, as you heard. And he said that even on easy, when you run at a lower intensity, he recommended having 180 or above. Uh, So that's that's a bit different to I. I'm going to readily admit to what I've said to my athletes. I said that if you're at 170 or so on your easy runs, that's okay. But as soon as you start adding a little bit more in- intensity, like zone three, especially zone four and zone five, then you need to be at 180 or above. Uh, but uh, but even with that 170, so a d- little bit of slack that I <laughs> that I cut my athletes with with that uh, margin to to the 180, I see a lot that are way below that, like at 160 or even in the 150s, and uh, and and this is just this is a small sample, of course, but I'm sure that the my percentages aren't that different from the actual percentage of. Uh, of the cadences that you see out there in triathletes. So chances are you may have a m- much too low a cadence. And these days with all the watches basically measuring cadence, uh, it's so easy to check that. And Or you can just use a, a metronome or whatever you want to use to check your cadence and actively try to shorten your strides, but make them quicker and get that free energy, that uh, oxygen sparing bounce effect, that springiness in your legs. So cadence is super important. And this is something that I, yeah, I, I talk about quite a bit with the athletes that I coach because I, I consider it very important, just as, as Tom said. And finally, this whole concept of learning how to teach your body to run, not how to learn to run per se. I think that's a great way of putting it. And basically you want to make the circumstances work in your favor. And uh, yeah, you want everything to line up so that your body 
can start to run the way it's meant to run and and it's not about necessarily trying to to actively do all sorts of fancy changes to your technique i think that's important to take away so especially when you go and see articles on how you can do some intricate changes in your technique and how that may improve your running uh, put put a bit of a filter on and and you i must remind you that this comes from a guy who did his phd in how the foot lands during or moves during landing in running so so tom could easily be somebody to go and say that you need to do all these small small details but he doesn't it it's much more of a holistic view and that's very important to keep in mind so as usual you can find the show notes for this episode on thattriathlonshow.com if you have questions or comments or uh, suggestions stories uh, case studies uh, please post them there i'd love to hear what you think about this episode and i'd love to answer your questions Uh, so yeah go ahead and post them on that comments page or the show notes page in the comments section And as I mentioned in the last episode, I want to repeat that message once again. Uh, If you spread the word about the show, tell your friends, tell your fellow triathletes, your club mates, uh, etc. to start listening to the show. And if you rate it and review it on iTunes, that helps me reach more listeners and, uh, and rise in the iTunes rankings. And that really helps with bringing some guests on the show that I really want to talk about and I want you to hear them. So so I hope that uh, if I can just increase the size of the show a little bit, then that will be cause a snowball effect and allow me to, to interview almost anybody. But uh, it, it's, not, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work and, uh, and definitely there is a lot of room to grow for this show. So I hope that you can help me out if you enjoy the show that is but then again i guess that if you didn't enjoy the show then you wouldn't still be listening uh, towards the very end of this episode because we're now coming up on the end of it we're just going to thank our sponsors first we have stack if you're looking for a new trainer i can personally recommend it because i use it the stack zero is a great trainer and you can learn more about it on stackzero.com that that's s-t-a-c Z-E-R-O dot com and use the discount code TTS20 for 20% off the trainer if you want to purchase one and remember that this is from an already fantastic price compared to other trainers with similar features also make sure that you listen to my interview with uh, with co-founder of Stack, Andrew Buckroll, back in episode 47 of the podcast. It's a great interview and it's more on aerodynamics and uh, Stack's other technology, the virtual wind tunnel. And this is a service that I actually now provide here in Lisbon and sometimes when I'm traveling, so for example to Finland. Uh, so if you want to learn more about your aerodynamics and uh, and test it, get specific numbers and accurate data for how you can improve it and how much time that may save you, and you happen to be in Lisbon or maybe in Finland, then do send me an email. Also, thank you to Precision Hydration for sponsoring this episode. And remember, when you get there, your first box of Precision Hydration product for free, which you can using the discount code Show, all one word, you should uh, check that it matches your individual sweat sodium content and your sweat rate. And you can find out your ballpark estimate for that by taking Precision Hydration's free online sweat test on precisionhydration.com. It's validated. It's, uh, they have used, they, they have accurate sweat testing machines and they've tested uh, a lot of athletes with both those machines and then had them take that, uh, that sweat test, which is a few short questions, a questionnaire basically. And they checked that, uh, that the results match up. So it's a very, very smart setup. And I also want to give a shout out to Andy Blow, the company founder. 
he is now co-hosting a triathlon podcast, The Brick Session. And uh, I think that he and the other co-host, they do a really, really great job with that podcast. I really enjoyed listening to, to all of those episodes. And I highly recommend that you check that out if you aren't already listening to it, especially in uh, the UK. I think it's, uh, it's pretty big, but I don't know about overseas. So, so definitely check it out, The Brick Session, and Andy Blow is one of the co-hosts. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.